It may be the most discussed and expensive non-event in human history. The Y2K crisis, a deviously simple computer flaw that could plunge the entire world back into the Stone Age. And in the late 90s, anyone who opened a major newspaper, logged on to AOL, or tuned into the world's most respected media outlets knew just how we were. Our entire way of life was at risk. It could trigger a nuclear war. There'd be blood in the streets. Millions would die. You get the picture. And these dire predictions weren't just coming from conspiracy nuts. These were technologists, titans of industry, and political leaders. Now, this is not one of the summer movies where you can close your eyes during the scary parts. In less than a decade, upwards of $300 billion was spent worldwide trying to prevent this calamity. And on New Year's Eve, 1999, when the ball dropped at midnight, pretty much nothing happened. The millennium arrived, people partied, and there was not a huge disaster. So what happened? Did hundreds of billions of dollars help us avoid Armageddon? Or maybe we got a little hysterical and just got the whole Y2K thing wrong. If we really want to understand the Y2K crisis, we've got to go back to the 1950s. Back then, computers were massive. I mean, room-sized. And they were crazy expensive. Case in point, this is what a five megabyte hard drive looked like back then. This state-of-the-art machine would have cost you about three grand a month just to lease. And it could only hold about six copies of this JPEG before it would run out of room. Programmers had to make compromises to save precious memory space. Like, for example, recording years as two digits instead of four. But what would happen when you reach the year 2000? Well, it was hard to say. Computers could malfunction or even fail completely. This programming shortcut was the source of the Y2K crisis, but it also saved early computer developers millions. For more than 30 years, things were great. Computers got a lot faster and cheaper and smaller. And this two-digit design flaw helped make all of that progress possible. But by the early 90s, a Canadian computer consultant named Peter DeJager was getting a little nervous. He began writing on his website about Y2K and what could happen if computers didn't recognize the year 2000. As he described it, business would come to a halt. It would cost billions of dollars. Could, he asked, such a catastrophe actually happen? Well, no one knows for sure. But the mere thought of computers failing in banks and hospitals, airports and nuclear power plants, well, it began to get people's attention. As the Ager's site grew in popularity, more and more people began to take notice. The New York Times called him the Paul Revere of the year 2000 computer crisis. And before long, he was delivering 85 speeches a year on Y2K. And Yeager wasn't alone. Andy Grove, the chairman of Intel, said the problem would be pretty bad. It was a threat without parallel in history, said a UN ambassador working on the issue. And according to the chief economist at Deutsche Bank, in the year 2000, Asia would be burnt toast. And it would be the worst disaster in modern history, said Ed Jordan, an MIT-educated software engineer. Even the president talked about it in his State of the Union. We also must be ready for the 21st century by solving the so-called Y2K computer problem. As the story was pushed along by journalists and politicians, any doubt and qualification were increasingly replaced by worst-case scenarios. A tidal wave of Y2K survival books were published, and they sold hundreds of thousands of copies. NBC did a made-for-TV movie about Y2K. Even Leonard Nimoy, Spock, got in on the act, hosting this hilariously bad Y2K survival video. Granted, there were detractors, too, who didn't believe Y2K would be a huge problem. One of the most notable was Bill Gates. He described it as a minor inconvenience. But minor inconveniences and things turning out fine are a little less captivating than an epic disaster, chaos, and the end of the world as we know it. So the frantic headlines kept getting cranked out, and some Americans began to prepare for the worst. A lot of Americans are taking no chances. They're prepared to survive no matter what happens. There was a spike in gun sales. Background checks hit record highs. Some poor souls built bunkers in their homes. And around the world, businesses poured hundreds of billions into beefing up their computer systems, creating lucrative opportunities for consultants and salespeople alike. But in the months before Doomsday, after a half decade of increasingly urgent clamoring, public opinion began to shift from <coughs> to meh. Around the same time, many of the most concerned politicians and experts were confident that they were ready. The government's Y2K czar pledged to fly on a plane on New Year's Eve to prove it would be safe. Even Pete DeAger began to pull back on some of his most alarming claims. Doomsday has been avoided. The terrible scenarios that we spoke about in the early days are no longer possible. 
Many turned their attention overseas, to the countries who'd failed to prepare since they were definitely just days away from calamity. China is a worry. Japan is a worry. Russia is a worry. Uh, Italy is a worry. But when the year 2000 arrived, all around the world, it was just like any other New Year's Eve. People cheered, they kissed, popped bottles. Everything was pretty much fine. The Y2K disaster that was anticipated for so long was nowhere to be found. Okay, to be fair, there were some problems caused by Y2K, but they were pretty minor. A printer that didn't work here, an incorrect date on a website there, a guy who accidentally got charged 100 years worth of late fees by his local video store, but no nuclear wars, no airplanes came crashing down out of the sky. In fact, there were no major disasters at all. So what was all the fuss about? In the United States, more than $100 billion had been spent on Y2K preparations, and more than $300 billion had been spent worldwide. So was it worth it? Well, on the one hand, since there weren't any major catastrophes, many people insisted that it was money well spent. This was a destroy companies, kill people kind of problem. This was a serious problem. But even the countries that did relatively little to prepare, like China, Japan, Russia, and Italy, and they didn't have many problems either. In fact, Russia spent almost nothing compared to the United States. And they didn't have many problems to speak of. And there's more. In the government's final report on the year 2000 crisis, they estimated that only one thousandth of one percent of embedded microchips would be affected by the Y2K bug. So it wasn't even as widespread a threat as they first believed. So there's at least some evidence that we probably overreacted. Maybe by a lot. Of course, it's easy to say that now. But nobody really knew what would happen back then. And when the alarm bells were ringing and lives could be at risk, it's easy to start imagining all sorts of disastrous end-of-the-world situations. Fortunately, all the predictions of epic disasters that were supposed to happen as a consequence of the Y2K bug turned out to be 